Thanks for listening to the Drummer's Weekly Groovecast. You can contact the show at twitter.com forward slash dwgroovecast and through Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Drummer's Weekly Groovecast. Good evening. I am warning you right now, if you touch my drum, I will stab you in the neck with a knife. Ain't a book. Ain't a book. Mom! Lower it. I'm, I'm not gonna lower it. I have to do this now. I don't want to play it, but lower it. Are we gonna straighten out? No, we had a problem. I mean, uh, we tried to do everything we could. What do you mean? Well, you know what I mean. Nice. Little trouble there. You're rushing. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hello, 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 drummers. How are you? Happy Monday. This is Phil here from the Drummers Weekly Groovecast. And once again, you are in store for a special educational edition. Uh, today, I'm doing another solo show. Um, and the topic is what qualities and characteristics make a good teacher? Now, Granted, we're going to be talking about this from the standpoint of a drum and or percussion teacher, but I mean, a lot of these same qualities that I'm going to be talking about today could be applied to your biology teacher or your physics teacher or what have you. So, you know, feel free to use it in a couple of different ways. But uh, I wanted to say that the idea for this show came from some students of mine and essentially what happened was I had a few students come in with uh, the same video, the same YouTube video, that has become a bit of a viral video in our drumming community. And the video was uh, a drummer who was doing a demonstration like at a master class or a clinic, and he fielded a question from his audience. And the question was, what makes a drummer a good drummer? And essentially, he did a demonstration of um, a simple song that used a simple drum beat and um, then he turned it right around and did the same demonstration of the same simple song but vastly overplayed and used you know that example as far as like well that's one thing that will you know make a good drummer a good drummer versus a bad drummer who overplays and doesn't serve the music etc and I kind of got the idea after these students brought these videos in that I would kind of turn the question around to them and I would ask them what they felt made a good teacher. And I got a lot of really interesting answers with that. And so this podcast is a bit of a tribute to these students and also me being a student. I, uh, put in my two cents also because I've studied with a lot of great drum teachers and so I figured that I would go ahead and put a few things together and you guys can use it for whatever you like you can use it for a checklist if you're looking for a teacher um, you know you can just use it if you're a teacher yourself and see how many of these qualities you feel like you might possess so we're going to go ahead and move forward with the show as always, we welcome your comments and ideas. Feel free to reach out to us at our email address, which is drummersweeklygroovecast at gmail.com. You can always get to us on our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash drummersweeklygroovecast. And you can always tweet us if you're a fella or a lady who likes to speak in 140 characters or less. Twitter.com forward slash DW Groovecast. All right. We will see you on the other side. So prepare yourself for snarky intro music. Salasia, 17th century. You will learn by the numbers. I will teach you. How can I learn you? How can I read you? How can I thank you? And I can out philosophize you.
All right. So what are we going to do with this topic today? What use is it? How can it be helpful to you as a student and or a teacher? Well, I'm going to put a little bit of work on you guys' plate because regardless of whether you're using it as a student to figure out what kind of qualities and characteristics you would like to find in a good teacher, or if you are a teacher and you kind of want to see how you stack up to this stuff, it's going to take a little bit of work. And you folks know that I'm not afraid to put some work on you. I'm all about having you guys be curious, do a little bit of drumming anthropology. You've heard me say that before. So what I want you students to do is when you're looking for a teacher, and this could be whether you're looking for a private teacher in your local city, if you're possibly looking towards going to music school, maybe looking at some of the different instructors that are there, or in, in today's educational culture, this might be the most important thing is you need to vet these online instructors as well because there's it's so easy to get online and you know type a topic in and you'll have 375 people address the same topic that how do you know what's right and wrong well you have to do a little work nothing comes for free guys so when you're looking at these online videos and these online instructors, you need to find out a little bit about these guys, even if it means you have to contact them directly and try to, you know, just ask them some questions or better yet, maybe even call them and see, you know, if they can answer the questions on the phone without having to think too much about it. That's an even better way to do it. And of course, check reputations from other students, just check reputations from, you know, a lot of teachers know each other. As a matter of fact, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that here in a few minutes. That you know, the teaching community and the music community in itself is small enough, and the grapevine is small enough that there's almost no one in this business that's any more than a couple of uh, you know branches of the tree or degrees of separation away from each other. So do your homework, do your research, find out something about some things about these folks. Find out who they've studied with. Find out the methods that they are. Uh, that they are familiar with and that they know. Find out how some of their other students have done. You know, if you see a, a, a teacher that has never put, you know, a student into a you know, a big music school, but that's what you're wanting to do. In other words, you're wanting to have the goal or the accomplishment of getting, you know, accepted into, you know, a large music school or music department. And especially if you want to try to get some kind of scholarship or financial assistance from the standpoint of not having to pay anything back, you want to make sure you go to the right source. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started on this. And we're going to talk about some of these different issues that um, you need to look for when you're looking for an instructor. Now, a few of these things, a few of these topics, it's going to seem, well, that's really obvious. But, you know, the devil's in the details. So let's go ahead and talk about a few of these, these what we might think are obvious um, qualities. So the first one is communication. You've got to have a teacher that knows how to clearly and accurately articulate his ideas and make it to where you can understand what he's talking about and what he wants you to do or what she wants you to do. I want to make sure that there's plenty of good female teachers out there. So I'll try my best to, to include the ladies in there. I know you're out there. It's not a slight. Um, so you've got to have a teacher that is a great, clear, concise, consistently articulate teacher that will help you out when you're learning things that you just are not familiar with. Now, let me go ahead and say this, and, and this is something that, that has, uh, I'm from the South, so I'm going to say that this has gotten stuck in my craw for years. And let me explain to you with a graphic example of what I mean of having a good, clean, clear, consistent, um, consistently articulate communicator. In, in our world, we have lots of eccentric folks that are out there. That's the best way I'm going to put it. I'm not going to use the word crazy. 
And in particular, it seems like we have a lot of our elder statesmen um, who are eccentric, a lot of eccentric older teachers that are out there. A lot of them have their specialties. They might be a technical guru or, or something along that line. And some of these folks are eccentric is what we'll call them. And my biggest problem that I have with that is I feel like that we allow them to be eccentric and in, t in turn, they play up to that sort of eccentric moniker that we put on there. And I've known a few people that have taken some lessons from some of these eccentric folks. And, you know, they get into the whole concept of like, man, having lessons with eccentric guy A was so fantastic. I spent an entire day with him and he talked in like these kind of cryptic quotes and these strange things. And then, you know, he made me go to the grocery store with him. And then when we were like browsing through all the chicken, he like dropped the heaviest, you know, the heaviest example, you know, of why I need to change my technique. And it was so profound, blah, blah, blah. Man, forget all that mess. There are a ton of great teachers out there that have just as much and probably more knowledge on some of these different on these different topics as some of these eccentric gurus that are out there. I mean, that's that's just as you can tell them on my soapbox right now, that's just one of my pet peeves. So there are some just fantastic educators out there. And, and as a matter of fact, I'm going to give you a few of them at the end uh, of the podcast. The, some of these guys that are some of the world's greatest educators and are mentors to myself and a lot of other folks. Okay. So that's the first really big point I want to get across to you is find a teacher that is an excellent communicator. And there are plenty of them that are out there. Okay. Another stem of this communication topic is Aside from talking, that's what we think about a lot of times is like, oh, we've got to have these guys that, that, that talk and communicate. The other 50% of communication is listening, right? So you've got to also have a teacher that is a great listener because he is going to or she is going to identify the different goals and the different things that you communicate to them that will help the student achieve their goals. So, yes, the student has to be a good communicator to communicate to the teacher who will then listen and interpret what needs to happen. So, therefore, he or she can then communicate back to the student, this is what we're going to learn and how we're going to do it to help you, little Johnny or little Janie, achieve your drumming and percussion nirvana. All right. Then one other aspect of communication. We're going to call it flexibility. In other words, there's there's a type of communication or there's a type of flexibility that involves being able to communicate uh, with students. And that type of flexibility is the ability to communicate the customization of needs to the individual students, because you have to understand that as a teacher, you, you have to teach a lot of the same things to other students or to all kinds of different students. However, my ability to teach student A, a double stroke role, could be very different than my ability in the way that I teach a double stroke role to student B. And again, very different the way that I teach a double stroke role to student C. So I have to be flexible in the way that I teach each of those different students the same exact thing. So that's what I mean by flexibility of communication. You have to be able to identify who you're talking to, what their needs are, and how they learn these different things that you're trying to communicate with. All right. So hopefully that will make a little bit of sense to everybody as far as like kind of isolating what we need to be aware of when we're looking for a good communicator. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is teaching experience. Okay. And there's quite a few things that go into the experience aspect. It's not just, Hey, I've been teaching for 30 years, but it also has to do about 
performing as well. In other words, what kind of performance experience can a teacher bring to the table? Because let's not lose sight of the fact that when we want to learn to play an instrument, we are wanting to learn to play this instrument not just to be in the basement or the bedroom, but we would ideally like to play this instrument with other musicians and ideally in front of an audience, right? So being able uh, to, as a teacher, to pass this performance, practical performance experience on to students is very, very, very important. So let's step back just for a second. Let's talk about past teaching experience, okay? Past teaching experience is exactly what it says it is. You might have a teacher that has been teaching for 20 years. You might have one that's been teaching for two years. For the most part, having a teacher that has taught for quite a while is normally better just from the standpoint that they've seen more students. They've seen more students. Hopefully they've also maybe just experienced more life just in general, which will help them be able to kind of pass that on to their students. And along with that ability or that past, say, 20, 25 years of teaching experience, hopefully you will also be able to see and or ask these teachers about their past student experiences and successes. So again, think about it from the standpoint that if you are, let's say that you are a student who really wants to go on the road and play with a major label artist. Maybe you seek out a teacher that has A, had some of that experience himself, and B, has some connections to get you into that position, and then C, maybe has had some previous students that are in that position right now. And as another example, let's say that you are a high school student that would like to go to Berkeley College of Music. Well, why don't you check in with this teacher and see if he's ever had any experiences with students being accepted into that school. Perhaps check with him and see if he has some connections up at that school as well. So being able to explore this teacher's past teaching successes, that should be able to help you out, you know, to identify whether or not um, this is the person you want to take lessons from. When we broach the topic of a teacher's past performance experience, that almost speaks for itself, doesn't it? And I mean, you know, if you are a guy who or a girl who is really into studying and perfecting and learning the vocabulary of jazz, if you've had a teacher that has played with some jazz greats, and especially if they're still actively performing, that in itself speaks volumes, doesn't it? In other words, that teacher should be able to pass that information directly on to the student. And um, one aspect of that is I feel like it's very important for teachers to be actively performing as well. With pretty much one of the only exceptions being is if you are studying with an older, retired teacher who's just pretty much physically not either able to play or, or get the equipment from point A to point B, then that makes sense. I totally understand that. But yeah, I, ideally, I think it's, it's very important for teachers to be actively performing and pass that just current, this is the state of the world uh, when it comes to playing music for a living information straight to their students. So, the next area and characteristic that I would like to talk about is a teacher's knowledge of the subject and the discipline that they're teaching. Well, you're probably saying, well, it's obvious I wouldn't even contemplate taking uh, lessons from someone that didn't know their instrument. Well, that's not exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, naturally, I mean, it takes uh takes a pretty good amount of gall for someone to teach a lesson that doesn't know anything about what they're trying to teach. It's not, not that. I, and I'll break it down into these different, um, these different categories or these different subjects inside of this knowledge topic that we're talking about here. But you have to understand that not every instructor is created equally when it comes to knowledge, right? And for 
trying to accomplish the goal that you as a student, you know, need to accomplish or want to accomplish. So the first part or the first subheading or subtopic under this knowledge category is you have to make sure that you have a teacher that is very strong and knowledgeable with the different technical aspects of the discipline or the instrument that you're working on. Ideally, you're going to have a teacher that's going to be able to help you with any type of technical issue, whether it comes to grip, hand positioning, pedal technique, foot positioning, heel up, heel down, rocking foot motion. Things as simple as like how to set up your drums ergonomically to where it fits your body. Instrument height, instrument angle, that type of stuff. They really need to be strong and well-versed in these different techniques. And then we haven't even gotten to the aspect of like things like if you want to be familiar with or know the molar technique or the level system or any of these different types of, of techniques that are just commonplace uh, to drummers. So the next thing is you need to make sure that this teacher is, I'll call them a master reader of musical notation. And what I mean by that is this teacher needs to be extremely comfortable reading and teaching reading. And it's not just normal, like regular notation. This is a whole note. This is a half note. This is a quarter note. That's a given. But this teacher also needs to be able to show you and convey articulately ways to read other types of notation or other types of charts, such as uh, how do you read a big band chart? How do you read and interpret a lead sheet? What if you're in a recording session and there's not a dedicated drum chart and then all of a sudden somebody hands you a, you know, a lead trumpet part? You need to be able to read and interpret these kind of things. And these are the type of things that, that a good teacher uh, should be able to be familiar with and show you those sorts of things. How about the Nashville number system? That's a wacky one. If you're, if you're familiar with just reading standardized notation, somebody hands you a Nashville number chart, um, that's going to certainly throw you for a loop. So it would be good to have a teacher that's familiar with that. And then also, uh, it would be good for a teacher to be able to show you kind of how to customize a chart or how to make notes on a chart or how to do some things on a chart where standardized drum notation and maybe like our standard groove and standard style type information is maybe not notated, maybe on like a rhythm section lead sheet. Uh, quick plug, if you go to our YouTube channel, just search Drummer's Weekly Groovecast on YouTube, you will see a video where I do demonstrate how I kind of customize three different style charts on there. So that will kind of tie into what I'm talking about here. Okay. Uh, next subtopic under the knowledge category is a teacher that is strong and familiar with all of the definitive percussion methods. Sounds familiar to some of you long-term listeners because I did a dedicated podcast to that. And uh, I encourage anyone who has not heard that to go back and look at it. It's, it's entitled the student and teacher vocabulary. And I go over a list of about uh, 20 or so definitive method books that we as drummers and percussionists, we study them as being, we'll call them the Bibles of drumming. It's the sort of thing I tell my students that, Hey, no matter where you go to study music, if these teachers are not somewhat familiar with these books, you need to leave a silhouette in the door, much like uh, the Roadrunner or the Wiley e. Coyote would do when he's escaping. So yeah, look for a teacher that is strong and very knowledgeable with the definitive methods of our trade. Next thing you need to have, you need to make sure that your teacher is very strong conceptually with musical ideas. You guys and ladies have heard me many times talk about the distaste. That'll be the best way that I can put it. The distaste that I have for a lot of these online 
uh, these video jocks that will get on there and they will show you, here's one hot lick by Vinnie Kaliuda, or here's the hot Steve Gadd flutter lick, or you get the, you get the gist. Here's the triplet groove of the week. And, you know, if you just want to learn that, I mean, that's fine. I mean, but it's a bit of a means to an end. So you need to have a teacher that is strong in musical concepts. And, and what that means is, hey, I'm going to give you some things to work on. But just working on these things is not the means to the end. These things are going to get you from point A to point B. And this is why. We want you to get stronger in this musical aspect of your drumming. And so, therefore, we want you to work on it. And then as you go through, we're going to musically apply it because this is our concept. And you can, virtually every style of music, every method that we use, there is a, you should have a concept for why you're doing it. In other words, you're not just trying to get from page 25 to 28 by next Monday. Know why you're doing that, right? In other words, know why you're accomplishing and working on what, or know what you're working on and why you're trying to accomplish it. Have the bigger picture, have the conceptual picture in your mind of what you're trying to do with this. And a good teacher should be able to kind of frame that for you. As a matter of fact, let me go ahead and say this also that, that I think kind of fits into this having a strong musical concept type thing. Most really good teachers, one of their most basic concepts, kind of a global concept, is that they are going to show you, they are going to instruct you in ways that will allow you to become self-sufficient to where you can teach and instruct yourself moving forward. Sometimes that's not necessarily verbalized or vocalized during a lesson, but that certainly is one of the main goals. In other words, I'm going to show you how to do some of this stuff. Therefore, in the future, you should be able to teach yourself. It's the old, uh, what do you want to do? You want to teach a man to fish, feed him for a lifetime, right? Instead of just giving him a fish and feed him for a day. So anyway, I kind of butchered that, but it's the beauty of like just winging it in front of a microphone, right? Okay. So <clears throat> moving on. It would be wonderful to also study with a teacher that aside from having their stuff together on the instrument of choice, drums that we're talking about, but it would also be great that they have some type of background in a melodic instrument. And all right, I can already hear you guys saying right now, well, drums are a melodic instrument if you play them correctly. Actually, let me go ahead and rephrase that and say, let's say a, a pitched melodic instrument and for us drummers, the most logical thing is some type of percussion keyboard instrument like marimba, xylophone, vibraphone, orchestra bells, that kind of thing. Um, sometimes that kind of leads itself into piano as well. And I know at one time it seemed to be a rite of passage for a lot of drummers that um, a lot of teachers would require them to take some form or a little bit of piano prior to taking drum lessons. I don't think it's nearly as strict and nearly as much of the, the normal thing to do that these days. But if you did have a teacher that was familiar with that type of stuff, I was very fortunate to have that when I was a, a kid in high school. Um, it will help them prepare you, especially if you're going to try to go into some type of music school. Uh, it will help them prepare you from a standpoint of, hey, you're going to have to play percussion keyboards when you get in school. And maybe even more immediately than that, you're going to have to take some theory and ear training. And this is going to help you in theory and ear training as well. Plus, on top of that, even if you don't decide to go to school, it just helps you just in general as a musician. You can, you know, you'll know what your other bandmates are talking about, whether it's guitar or keyboard or horn players, when they start talking about you know, chord structures and, you know, changes that we're playing and melodic phrases and whatnot. It's just a good bit of information to have in your backpack there. Okay. So it's really good to have some kind of a background with a teacher that has melodic instrument knowledge. 
And then lastly, and we've already talked about this a little bit at the very, very, very beginning of the show. One of the very most important things that a teacher can do is have experience and have knowledge in past music and then therefore encouraging listening and curiosity in students. So in other words, a teacher having deep musical roots, or like you've heard us say on the show before, just good musical depth, they can combine this in these different aspects of knowledge we've talked about with like the, the techniques and definitive methods and then strong musical concepts. And they can say, hey, look, all this stuff that we've been working on, why don't you go to YouTube or go to the library or go to iTunes or wherever you buy or get your music and listen to these recordings. Do some work. See how this stuff is actually used in the real world. So that type of encouraging of research and encouraging uh, students to be curious, inspiring curiosity, you know, assigning these different types of musical listening endeavors, it's critical. And if a teacher is not aware of those, if they're not knowledgeable with these different, you know, historical recordings and just different past recordings that illustrate these types of concepts and different types of musical styles that we're trying to learn, uh, that's a that's a pretty big void that's left in a teacher's um, acumen. So you definitely want to make sure that a teacher is familiar with some of these things in the past so that they can kind of uh, encourage you to do a little bit of our famous musical and drumming archaeology. All right, moving on. Now let's talk about teacher organization and preparation. Well, that again seems like a little bit of a given, doesn't it? But, you know, we're going to color outside the lines a little bit and talk just a little bit about some of the details when it comes to this. Something that I like to do to keep my students and even myself organized when I'm teaching private lessons is I like for my students to keep some type of a record like a blank notebook that has the lesson assignments and plans and just different things that I've written down in there for them. It works really in two different ways. One, it allows the student to go home and look at what they're expected to be working on over the next week and it doesn't force them to have to memorize it in a lesson or maybe even memorize it and then think about or, or misconstrue the information, I should say, and then practice the wrong thing or maybe miss the gist of what the lesson is all about. So that certainly helps the students stay in line from week to week. Secondly, and sometimes most importantly for the teacher, it helps keep the teacher in line as well. It's, it's probably even more important from the standpoint of keeping that notebook for the teacher because a teacher a lot of times will teach anywhere between, you know, half a dozen to, you know, three dozen students a week. And it's virtually impossible to keep those, you know, separate lesson plans uh, separated and individualized between the students. It's going to, it's very easy to, to forget, uh, you know, what you have assigned student A as opposed to what you assigned student B, C, D, E, F, and so on. So that record keeping is very important from both of those standpoints, not only for the student, but for the teacher. Part three to this notebook is it creates a timeline so that the student and teacher can gauge the improvement of the student. For example, if a teacher has assigned, let's say, paradiddles and flam taps, and then he looks back four or five, six weeks, and all of a sudden he sees almost no improvement in that, then he knows that this student has not been working the way that he should be. So, you know, it's the type thing that it 
it can be a gauge of improvement as well. You can put things in there as far as like, of course, these are the pages that we're working on. These are the rudiments that we're working on. These are the different exercises that we're working on. But you can also put things in there like metronome markings as well, where you can gauge speed, you know, if that's something that you're working on at that time. Another great aspect of organization is having a teacher use their experience to show students how to actually practice between lessons. Now, what I really mean by that is how do you instill productive routines? In other words, really make sure that a student is actually practicing what they need to be practicing. I think you long-term listeners have heard me talk about that before. That's the majority of the time. That's the thing that actually is the problem with students that are not making the progress that they feel like, or the teacher feels like they should be making. It's just that a lot of times an innate human trait is we have the tendency to already play things or practice things that we sound good on. And, you don't want to do that. You want to make sure that your practice time is actually spent working on things that actually need to be worked on. And a teacher should be able to help you kind of identify that problem and then help you, you know, avoid that problem and get past it. Because I, I've, I've seen it happen time and time and time again, and I've been a victim of this before. You go to the practice room. And you sit down and you get the materials out that you need to be working on. And you look at your clock and you say, okay, it's 3.15. I'm going to practice till 5 o'clock. And you get in there and you get going a little bit, get hung up on something. Then all of a sudden, well, you know what, I'll jam a few minutes and, you know, I'll get back on this. Jam a few minutes. Then the phone rings. You go and you pick up the phone. You have a conversation for a little while. You go back. Sit down. I'm going to buckle down and work on this stuff. Work for another minute or so. Get hung up again. You know, I'm kind of hungry. I think I need a sandwich. You go in, have a sandwich. Then all of a sudden, somebody yells at you from the living room. Come and look at this thing on TV. You got to see this. And you finally get back into the practice room. Start working a few more minutes later. Then all of a sudden, you get a text message. And you, you see where this is going, then all of a sudden 5 o'clock rolls around and you've actually gotten a grand total of about 10 minutes of real practice in, right? And then, you know, you think to yourself, wow, man, I said I practiced for an hour and 45 minutes. No, you didn't. You practiced for about 10 minutes. So it's very important that, that a teacher can help you identify that and help you structure a productive practice schedule. In other words, make sure that you focus in on what you're doing. Now, of course, no teacher can just beat this information in your head. No teacher can sit right behind you at a practice session and make sure that you're practicing from, you know, 4 o'clock till 7 o'clock at night. There's, so it, it absolutely depends on, you know, the student being honest with themselves and, and being disciplined as well. But a teacher can help you at least identify that and help you get yourself on the, the right page so that when you are practicing, that you are practicing the things that need to be practiced and you're practicing it for the right amount of time. So they can help you eliminate those distractions and get yourself focused to where you can actually make some progress in the practice room, right? And sort of along that same lines, um, a teacher should be able to set certain expectations for the student to help you stay organized and stay consistent to help you achieve the goals that you want to achieve right? So in other words, the organization of a teacher to be able to, to keep all these different goals and these different ideas together, use a lesson plan to get you from point A to point B and be able to consistently communicate that to you, that in itself is incredibly valuable. So all those different things together kind of fits under our heading of a teacher being organized, okay? So also, we want to make sure as teachers and as students looking for teachers that they know that their teacher is staying current by, we'll say, engaging in continuing education. Or a lot of the professional folks will say CE, continuing education, right? Think of it this way. In virtually every 
profession that's out there, to, to maintain a certain level of proficiency and a certain level of currentness, I think I just made that word up. In fact, I'm sure I made that up. Sorry about that, English teachers that might be listening to this. These professionals have to go to continuing education classes. Well, we don't really have that so much with what we do, so it's incumbent upon us as educators to kind of create and stay consistent with continuing education. And again, let me kind of explain some of this to you as far as like kind of what I mean by this. As teachers, we want to always be continually learning and embracing new technology. And I'll give you just a brief story on, on how I feel about that. It wasn't that long ago that I was in graduate school. And when I was in graduate school, we didn't really engage in things like home recording, microphone placement, just overall technology that really wasn't a big part of the curriculum at all when I was in graduate school. And if you would have told me when I was in graduate school, this is in the, the early 90s, if you would have told me back then that 20 years later, I would have a studio in my house that I would be playing to tracks live consistently. Well, that, again, boy, that was, that was a horrible use of the English language. I'd be consistently playing to tracks in a live setting. How's that? And then I would be using a click track or a metronome live in virtually all settings. I would have said you were out of your mind 20 year, 25 years ago. But it is becoming the norm. It's the rule now. It's not the exception. So it is important for teachers to maintain a current level of technology and a current, also just maintain their just overall learning of what is new and current in our business. It is, it's vital. So hopefully if you have a question for your teacher when it comes to like, hey, I need to buy a couple of microphones to, you know, record a snare drum solo for an audition, or I need some advice on some software to help me record, or I need some kind of a, you know, a converter or mic preamp. You know, hopefully a teacher should be able to, to point you in the right direction for that sort of thing. Because again, it's something that, uh, you know, we have to deal with all of the time now. And I mean, again, it's just normal now to be able to, it's, you, you have to be able to play with live to clicks and sequences and stuff. So it's very important to have a teacher that's familiar with that type of stuff. Another thing, it's very important for teachers to learn new techniques and to disavow or to jettison disproven ideas. In other words, not be dogmatic to old ideas that just don't work anymore. And again, for our long-term listeners, you know, I did a, a, another special edition educational podcast about malleable grip and technique. That's something, this is kind of goes along those lines and, and what that podcast was about, or one part of it was about was, um, there were certain students that I had had where teachers had really pounded it into their head that once they learned a certain type of technique that it always stayed consistent regardless of the musical style, the instrument that you're playing on, etc. And that's just not the case. It's just absolutely not the case. Um, you can go back and listen to that episode to get more on that, but I, I think it's very important for a teacher to grow and even if there's something that they've worked on or if there's a technique or a concept that they spend a lot of time and a lot of energy on learning as a, you know, a young player, if it just doesn't work and it's been disproven, you have to be mature enough and you have to be professional enough to, to just jettison that idea and move on to what is, you know, what actually does work. Now I'm going to give you a story about that. Another story, another story that I, that, from personal experience. I'll tell you about that in a second. But yeah, it's very important 
to be able to be mature enough to get past, um, you know, an idea that doesn't work, regardless of the amount of time that you spend on it. And one of the problems we have, again, it's just a human, human trait, is that many times when we work really diligently on something for a long period of time, it, it kind of becomes a part of our personality, becomes a part of who we are. And therefore, once something like that has been disproven, it's very hard for us to, to admit that it is not valid because it's, it's almost like admitting that who we are and what we've worked on is a fraud or it's just not correct or it's just invalid. Almost like what you've worked on has, has now become a character flaw because it's no longer valid. And you have to get past that point. And again, that's something th that you can see in virtually every field. Look how many times do you see online, you read the news and, and you know, one bit of medical evidence has disproven that coffee is bad for you. It's actually good for you. And then somebody who studied for 30 years that said that coffee is bad for you jumps right back in and says, nonsense, I've been studying this for 30 years and your research is bunk. That's the kind of stuff I'm talking about is that, is that, you know, if you've discovered that something that you've worked on for a long time and that you believed was rote just doesn't work, you need to get past it. Now, let me give you my story. Um, back when I was a kid, back when I was in undergraduate school, um, I had the privilege of studying with a very, very, very well-known drummer that if I mentioned his name, everyone would know who he is. And if you didn't, shame on you, but I'm not going to mention his name. Although actually this is going to be a quite, quite a testament to what I'm talking about from the standpoint of somebody who's grown and has gotten past this. And, uh, you know, it's actually a feather in his cap. But when I took some lessons from him, the very first lesson I had with him, was he had me sit down behind the drums and he said, okay, we're going to play some time and we're going to play some jazz swing time. And he said, here's your tempo. I'm going to count you in and I want you to play for me. Anything you play is right. Don't worry about it. I'm not looking for anything in particular. And so I sat down, he counted off the tempo. I played, he let me play for maybe like 45 seconds to a minute. And he stopped me and goes, great. Now let me ask you this. Why did you do this? And what he pointed to was with my right hand, I was playing a sort of a technique on the cymbal. It's called the pendulum motion. And, you know, you have to study that a little bit for those of you who don't realize what it is. But it's a type of phrasing and a type of motion that we use on the ride cymbal that, um, that creates a certain type of phrasing when we play uh, a jazz ride pattern. He asked me why I did that. And I explained to him why I did that. And he goes, I don't want you to do that. I think that's wasted motion. And I think it actually provides room for error and inconsistency inside of your ride pattern. He goes, instead, I would like for you to try this. And what he did was he switched places with me at the drum set, and then he played the same jazz ride pattern, but he played it within a, a span of about one inch on the cymbal where his stick just went straight up and down into the cymbal. There was no pendulum motion. There was no particular phrasing. All the notes were very, very equal, equal distance, equal height off the cymbal and just in a very, very small place, you know, on the cymbal. And, you know, it was what it was and it sounded the way that it sounded. It didn't sound great to me. And, uh, you know, that was one of those times where I took that as a lesson of something that I didn't want to do. I learned a lot of other great things from this, this guy, but I took that as something that I didn't necessarily want to do. And so after my lesson was over with this guy, um, I lost contact with him and didn't really speak with him. And I guess maybe 10, 12 years later, he put out an instructional, uh, video and sure enough, in that instructional video, he had completely changed 180 degree turnaround. He was now trumpeting the benefits of the pendulum arm motion for playing that jazz ride pattern. So some people might call that a flip flop. I don't think so. I think that's just the, the ability to, to change and embrace things that work for him and that sound better to him. Uh, it takes a lot to do that. I mean, 
you know, when I took lessons from this, from this gentleman, he was really forging his own concept. He really was, which there's absolutely nothing wrong with it because I mean, you know, you want to have a concept for why you're, you know, why you're doing a certain thing like that. And his concept was consistency, consistency, consistency. In other words, less wasted motion, um, and, and just consistent strokes from a consistent distance in a consistent place. And, and to kind of go along with that at that time, he also, he had, he had his own signature stick, which had a round, small round bead on the top. And, and that in itself, anybody, you know, who's into that whole things about the physics of a drumstick know that the reason you have a completely round bead is for consistency on cymbals, no matter how you hold the stick, no matter what angle, etc., you get the same kind of consistency with that round bead on a cymbal. So anyway, yes, that's what I mean is some, someone that continues to learn and involve and evolve and, you know, they won't stay dogmatic to a disproven idea or concept. So I think that's very important in, in a teacher. Lastly, I uh, ask one of my really good long-term students if she had any ideas or if she had any different types of thoughts regarding what she felt um, made a good teacher. And she said humility. And I thought that that's a wonderful, wonderful thought. And basically she said that she would never want to be looked down upon or being taught down upon by having a, a teacher that felt that they were on such a different plane or such a different level that they had to dumb it down or they had to look down upon the student um, to teach them. And so as a teacher, that's something we have to be very careful about is that we realize that as teachers, that students are coming to us for our knowledge and for our experience, but we have to be really careful not to look down on them or to teach down on them or to make them feel inferior for coming to us, much less asking uh, about information that, that they would like to know or learn about. So yeah, that's, that's a great point that she made. So we also have to maintain our humility and make sure that when you're looking for a teacher that you find that trait in them as well. Okay, so I told you at the beginning of the show that I was also going to name a teacher or two that I felt that kind of embodied all these different traits and characteristics of a good teacher. And so I'm going to go ahead and tell you what I think now. To me, the ultimate embodiment of all these different wonderful traits is the great Ed Sof. I had the pleasure of studying with him a few different times and the majority of my study was actually done with one of his protégés, one of his other students. But Ed Sof is, has been the long term, long time teacher at university of North Texas. Prior to that, he was at university of Connecticut at Bridgeport. Um, he is one of the foremost communicators of drumming knowledge that's ever existed. He is an absolute gem of a communicator and a fountain of knowledge. And I encourage anyone who has the ability to study with him, contact him and do so. Also go online and look for a series of videos that he's put out. I believe it's with the Evans Drumhead uh, Corporation. You can tell just by watching these videos that this guy is a master educator. He is one of the most knowledgeable people of every different type of technique and musical style and concept that you can find. And he is also a very humble guy that he really has the student's best interest at heart and tries to help them achieve their goals, regardless if they want to be a heavy metal player or if they want to play in Glenn Miller's orchestra. You just have to look at Ed's past students look at the list of successes that he's had such as john robinson dave weckle keith carlock ari honig a good friend of mine jim white teaches at the university of northern colorado and then my mentor keith brown teaches at the university of tennessee if you've ever seen any of these guys teach 
or give a master class or a clinic, they are carrying on that same type of strong tradition of being excellent communicators of drumming knowledge. I remember seeing Dave Weckl give a clinic back in, I guess it was 1986 or 1987. And the thing that I was most impressed with was not the playing. It was his ability to teach. It was absolutely fantastic. And this was prior to me actually studying with Ed Sof. So I see where he got it now. So Ed Sof, guys, that's who I want you to do a little bit of research on. For those of you who are not familiar with him, look at some different videos of his that are out there on YouTube, like I mentioned before. See if you get something out of it. Okay, one last thing, and then we're going to go ahead and shut down the podcast for the week. Um, brief word to the students out there. Guys and girls, you do have some what we'll call student obligations as well. So it's not all on the teachers. There's some obligations for the students that go past uh, learning the lessons that these teachers have assigned you from week to week. First and foremost, you need to always listen. Put that in the forefront of your brain, right? Listen, listen, listen. And then allow your curiosity to be piqued and do your research. Learn things outside of the books. Learn how to apply this stuff. Do your drumming anthropology. You guys know that's one of my favorite sayings on this show. Do your drumming anthropology. Get in there and dig in. Figure out why Tony Williams was Tony Williams. Figure out why Vinnie Colaiuta is Vinnie Colaiuta. Figure these things out on your own. Be curious, right? That is an obligation on the student, okay? Next thing, I want to talk to students about taking what we'll call short-term or one-off lessons. And a lot of times this is a lesson that you will take with a, we'll call them a famous drummer or a name drummer who specializes in one particular, you know, aspect of drumming. And so here's what I want to say about that. Make sure as a student, when you book one of these lessons, which you will probably have to pay a fairly good price for, make sure that you are prepared and you know who you're taking this lesson from. Okay. So let me, make this example for you here. If you are going in to study double bass drum with a double bass drum master, you're probably going to be better off studying double bass with him than asking him about how he plays a bossa nova or how he plays brushes on ballads. Does that make sense? In other words, Make sure that you know who you're taking this lesson from, what their specialty is, and then you utilize this teacher for his specialized knowledge in that field, right? On top of that, make sure when you're taking one of these one-off lessons that you come prepared with questions. At the very least, come in prepared wanting to, wanting to talk to this teacher about what you want to learn particularly from him in this hour or so that you're going to spend with them, right? That is, that's on you. That's your obligation to do that. Because if you just walk in with a pair of sticks and you don't have any idea of what you want to learn or what you want to do, the teacher's going to sit down and he's pretty much going to be, he's just going to be thinking you're just a blank slate. And then he's going to say, well, you know what? I understand that you're working on this, but you need to make sure that you work out of this method book and then practice with a metronome. Ta-da! You could have gotten that from virtually any teacher. So really make sure you're prepared when you go in to take a one-off style lesson. All right. Okay, guys, I hope you got something from this today. I thought it was an important topic and I wanted to address it. Uh, I'm as you guys know, I'm very passionate about education. I love teaching. I love the nuts and bolts of drumming, the different aspects of, you know, the technique and the concepts of music. And I love being able to share the knowledge that I have. And I think it's just very, very important that students are aware of who they're taking lessons with, who they are potentially taking lessons with, because you want to make sure that you're studying with the right people, because if you go in and if you don't if you don't do your research 
And if you don't know who you're taking lessons from, you could go in there, you could start taking lessons from someone that doesn't know anything. And I mean, let, let's just be honest. Teachers who are not well versed in these different aspects that we're talking about, they're they're committing a type of educational fraud. Just putting it putting it bluntly there. And I mean, even if it's not even if you're smart enough and you are thinking, well, this is never going to happen to me. Well, maybe you have a little next door neighbor that wants to take drum lessons. You're not able to teach him, but yet they know this guy down the block at this music store that teaches and all this guy does is he has a student come in and shows him this hot licks and you know we'll we'll show him how to play the groove from the latest green day album again that's kind of the same thing i mean you know it's fun up to a point but again it's really not you're doing a disservice as a teacher uh, or as a student also that doesn't make this other student aware that you know there are probably better options out there so all right, guys, thanks again for listening. We always appreciate you tuning in to our show and subscribing to our show. We're available on iTunes, Google Play Podcast, Podbean, Stitcher, virtually every single podcast app out there. If you search our name, Drummer's Gro Weekly Groovecast, if I could actually say it, Drummer's Weekly Groovecast, you will find us if you don't find us please send us an email and let us know you're having trouble finding us. Uh, our, our host um, is SoundCloud. You can always do a search on SoundCloud and find us as well. But hopefully we've made it easy for you to find us when you want to listen. Um, reach out to us. Our email account is drummersweeklygroovecast at gmail.com. Facebook is facebook.com forward slash drummersweeklygroovecast. And tweet us at twitter.com at dwgroovecast. All right, we appreciate each and every one of you. Thanks again for listening, and until next week, we bid you adieu.